Good evening, members. Before we open the meeting, um, can I ask that any members or officers in physical attendance with an electronic device mute it in order to avoid feedback? Um, any remote participants, can you keep your camera and microphone off unless you wish to speak? And ideally, not use the camera facility at all, as this can affect the quality of the meeting. The meeting may be recorded and data collected during the recording of the meeting will be retained in accordance with the Council's data retention policy. The recording of the meeting may be added to the Council's website. Members accessing the meeting remotely should use their SBC or KCC laptop to participate virtually. If you join using the link on the website or on a mobile and tablet device, it's not always possible to identify you and you may not be recorded as in remote attendance. Can I ask members to speak loudly and clearly into their microphones and to switch their microphones off after speaking? Otherwise, remote participants may be unable to hear the next speaker. Um, can I welcome everyone to uh, the Environment Committee uh, this evening, uh, including any visiting members attending remotely and any members of the public? Um, the following staff are in attendance in the meeting room or remotely. The Head of Environment and Leisure, Martin Cassell, the Green Spaces Manager, Graham Tuff, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Project Officer, Grace Couch, Democratic Service Officers, Philippa Davis, Joe Millard, and uh, Jay Jenkins, the Leisure Services Manager. There's no fire drill planned this evening, and if the alarm sound sounds, you should leave by the exits indicated and assemble outside where directed. Do not use the lid. Is there anyone in attendance who requires extra assistance? If so, can you make yourself known? Thank you. Um, can I ask if there are any apologies for absence? I have confirmation of any substitutes. Thank you, Chair. Apologies have been received from Councillor David Simmons, who is substituted by Councillor Mike Whiting, from Councillor Eddie Thomas, and from Councillor Pete Neal, who is substituted by Councillor Peter Marchington. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, can I ask if there are any declarations of interest? OK, thank you, members. Um, so can I ask members to approve uh, there are two sets of minutes to approve to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of November 2022, which is minutes numbers 415 to 421. Thank you. Uh, and can I also ask you to approve the minutes of the extraordinary meeting held on the 19th of December? 2022 minute numbers 5444 to 548 was a correct record. Thank you. Okay, the following items are part B reports for decision by the Environment Committee. Item five is the forward uh, decisions plan. Um, you've got it in front of you there. Um, there are a number of papers coming to the next meeting, a couple that have been referred, one from the Council and one from the Sheffield Area Committee. Um, are we happy to move on? Yes. Thank you. So item six is open spaces and play strategy uh, a review. Um, I think this is going to be uh, introduced by, by Graham. Um, and uh, the idea is very much that uh, it's an opportunity for you to have initial uh, input uh, into the content of the re review and raise issues that you're concerned about. So it's very much a, a discussion uh, item. But, so Graham, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Um, as has been sort of said, the uh, report is the starting point of a process 
uh, for reviewing uh, the open spaces and place strategy. Um, obviously, it comes under this committee uh, in terms of its responsibility. Um, although uh, an element of the um, report and strategy was considered by the community committee uh, yesterday evening, uh, and that that involved for a specifically around play. The um, strategy was developed in the, or the existing strategy uh, was developed in 2017 um, and runs between 2018 and 2022. Um, essentially, it, it has two main um, two main purposes and pieces of work. Uh, firstly, to guide our work and our direction strategically. Uh, in terms of how we manage uh, and uh, run open spaces and play areas within the borough. Uh, and secondly, uh, from a planning perspective, it guides the uh, future development of open spaces um, and facilities uh, within sort of new development, uh, also particularly housing development. Um, the report um, runs through the national um, planning policy uh, where it fits with the corporate uh, plan um, and uh, obviously sort of within it, there are the sort of key principles identified uh, that are within the existing uh, um, strategy, which is attached to uh, appendix one. Um, I think there's a number of um, key issues that have sort of come to the fore um, so sort of since the strategy was developed um, and, and there were perhaps we're looking at uh, things, how to um, or how to in include them within uh, the new strategy uh, and that includes the declaration of climate and ecological emergency um, how tree planting uh, can specifically be included within the strategy and so sort of your views and, and thoughts on new burial space within cemeteries um, the In terms of time scale, we are looking at um, commissioning a technical assessment, which will provide the, the, the basis of need for the borough uh, and, and work through all the quantity and quality um, issues. Um, that, that will be uh, commissioned over the coming months. Um, and then we will, once that has been received, then off the back of that, we will start to um, sort of draft the, the actual policy document uh, before bringing it back to, to members, undertaking consultation, etc. Um, and that, that will certainly be sort of third or fourth quarter. So that can raise the background in terms of, uh, uh, of time scale. Um, over to you. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Graham. Can before I open it up, can I just um, ask for a couple of a little bit of clarification on a couple of things? Um, and in 3.4, you've you've kind of identified what what we might want to pick up on. Um, I'm I, I think I would find it helpful just to have a bit more of an understanding about the issues related to cemeteries and, and burial space. And also, I know in the discussion yesterday there was quite an emphasis on um, new developments and, and the potential passing over of, of land um, and also on community asset transfer where we own land. Um, I don't know whether just a little bit about the particularly you know, in the current context we're operating the, the financial implications of those might be, might be helpful by way of introduction. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to cemeteries and burials, we currently operate uh, five cemeteries. Uh, Barisham, uh, Sittenborn, Iowaid, uh, Shepherd Cemetery and Merston. Um, in terms of new burial plots, we don't have any left in Sittingbourne uh, or Sheffield. Um, so currently, all new burial plots are provided at Iowa Wade. Um, we have approximately 10 years left at Iowa Wade, um, taking 
predicting in terms of predicting the uh, the, the burial uh, numbers that we currently get. Um, and uh, previously, um, unfortunately, I can't give you a date. There was a decision not to progress with uh, burial grounds in uh, on the island um, or within City Mall. Um, the Highway Cemetery um, came about through a Section 106 agreement um, that involved the uh, um, sort of the development sort of around Highway. Um, which we subsequently sort of took on. Um, so that's that's the current position with with cemeteries and burials uh, within the borough. And I think it's it's that question of um, it's not it's, we don't have to provide burial space. Um, it's not a statutory service. Um, so it is very much a case of of what's the policy going forward, what, what are we going to do in terms of, of looking for uh, new burial space if we decide that it is something that, that this authority is going to continue with. Um, I'll make the point at this, uh, this stage that we would continue on with our existing cemeteries and reopen reopen burials, um, etc. and continue to, to manage and maintain. Um, sort of going forward, irrespective of, of that as an issue. Um, Martin, Martin, you must come in. Yeah, sorry, just just just, just to add to that. So um, you might say, well, 10 years uh, highway, 15, 10 to 15 years in Faversham, why are we raising the point now? Because the reason we are is because it needs to go, it would need to go into the local plan this, in this cycle. It's not easy to find land to get the relevant uh, licenses and permissions to to be able to um, to to bury um, in into the ground. So we would really need to start that process fairly soon, or certainly in this next cycle uh, of, of this strategy, in order to to do that. It is a service that costs the council, um, and so that with it not being statutory, that's you know part of the discussion to tonight. Um, to, to to how we consider that in the strategy. Okay. And the other thing I was just, just going to ask you to touch on was um, development and and transferring land to the council and the council transferring land to um, community and the community and the, and the, the possible financial implications of that. Um, in terms of um, new development and. Uh, Section 106 agreements. So we um, currently, the last five five years, uh, haven't taken on new develop new new open space land from developers. Um, we've had a policy in place which requires developers to make alternative arrangements, uh, and that can be through could be through any number of different arrangements. That could be with um, the um, parish council uh, managing it. Um, that could be through a management company managing it. Um, the um, if that that is apart from strategic open, excuse me, <coughs> strategic open space, um, which which is part of the agreement that we do take on. Um, because it's seen as a as a strategic element, so a, a, a large country park, a large country gap um, between uh, between um, uh, towns, villages. Um, so the alternative arrangements are usually uh, dictated by um, and, and founded within Section 106 agreements, uh, which are obviously legal agreements. Requires the developer to. Um, sort of continue with the open space to manage it in a certain way. Usually, it comes with a, a, a management plan. Um, it requires them to finance that, which is usually uh, an arrangement through a management fee to the people who live on the uh, development. Um, and uh, all of the um, the work that is undertaken is vested is invested within sort of the management company or the alternative management group um, that looks after the space. Um, 
there has been in the past been um, a move towards um, community asset transfer. So we have a number of facilities, uh, sports, sports groups, sports clubs that have um, taken on open space uh, as part of their um, remit. So they may use um, uh, sports grounds uh, specifically for um, football, rugby, etc. Um, and uh, the authority has taken in the past the the um, the route of of vesting those uh, through leases uh, or or different agreements um, to those to those different groups. Um, a lot of the time, that means that the the uh, financially that the um, the burden is upon the upon the the group, um, and and obviously they manage those those spaces. Usually, oh, I think in every occasion, you know, where it's public open space, um, the, the the requirement to um, to keep it as public open space remains. So, although a sports club may have a lease over a piece of ground, um, and I can think of um, Seagrove Sports Ground in, in Sheerness, um, most of the recreation ground in, in Sitting Bull, where where those clubs have have that ground uh, under lease, they're free to use it for for their sport. Um, but there is also the need to maintain it as public open space, so they can't stop people from going on there. And that's again, that's written written in within the uh, legal document. So it's just a, it's really it's a way of of um, of the uh, group or the the club taking responsibility uh, and ownership of the, over their own spaces, um, and obviously that reduces the, uh, the burden on the um, local authority in terms of the budget. Um, so that's reasonably positive um, as, as long as the, the, the club continues to function um, and that's potentially risk uh, is is that they struggle with with the finance of it um, and uh, there's also sort of a risk around the, um, the the potential for it coming back to us Okay, thanks. Thanks, Graham. That's a very kind of clear and helpful mm -hmm. overview. Okay, um, so I'm going to open the uh, discussion now. I've got Councillor True Love, Councillor Daly, and Councillor Whiting, and then we'll have Councillor Winkless. Councillor Councillor True Love. Thanks very much, Chair. And uh, I, I know we have to get down to discussing where we put cemeteries, <laughs> um, and we obviously get into questions of land ownership and land management and whether clubs run it and so on. But I, I'd just like to do a bit of an overview as well. Um, I think in the context of the corporate plan, uh, our open spaces are of the highest priority. Um, they have been over the last few years, and I think they should definitely continue to be whatever the challenges might be. Uh, you'll all be aware that during the pandemic, a lot of our uh, residents discovered open spaces in a way that they perhaps had never done before. I have neighbours who didn't know you could walk up to Tunstall <laughs> from where I live, and that they, they started to do it. And as, as you, I mean, we went walking every day as part, you know, part of the routine, really. And as you go up to St George's, uh, King George's Park, there's just massive people there walking around and, and in, enjoying it. It's not quite like that now because the pandemic is um, abated, uh, but the, the health value of that is so self-evident. Um, if people do that and stay fitter, uh, the costs of the National Health Service will start to go down. And so, you know, if this council as a council should make the statement that it's very important that we, we have uh, these open spaces, of which we have a considerable rich resource, really, uh, and and that people should use it. And I also think it's a it's a matter of uh, pride, you know, the extent to which the public have a sense of pride. That partly depends on how we maintain open spaces. Do, do we make it look like the sort of place you want to go? And, and, and you know, we've dined out a lot and putting a toilet on the Lees at Minster, but it does make going to the Lees a much more feasible and uh, 
worthwhile thing to do that you you're not you know you're not going to spend half an hour there and they think you've got to drive back to tesco's uh, so you know i think that is important that we demonstrate that we have a pride in our, our local facilities and of course that also reflects on how the public see this council you know does this council care yeah it does because we put in benches in parks we put in trees in parks um, and we cut the grass occasionally um, and, and even uh, even some of our football pitches look okay so you know I think all those things matter and that's why I think you know open spaces as a district council is, is a very important aspect going going on to tree planting yeah we've planted lots of trees and we should continue to do so and again that's not only good to do but it's something that the public like us to do and it does demonstrate that the council and the public are pretty much on the same page um the definition of open spaces we, as i said we've got a lot of variety a lot of resource so we've got our public parks and we have been taking more care of them and we need to continue to do that that the country walks that are available to people that they are especially important as well um and and sports pitches and so on these things have improved i, I you know genuinely argue that they've improved a lot they need to continue that process uh, and also to maintain how far we've come and, and we actually achieve con continuity as a council notwithstanding we know that our finances are going to be tight over the next few years but what i'm really saying is that this is an op this is an, an option for reducing spending you know this is something we could get away with not doing so much here and there but we don't really want to do that this, this should be a very high priority but i don't know where the cemetery should go i really don't <laughs> OK, thank you, Councillor Trudeau. That's a very good upbeat uh, um, contribution. Uh, Councillor Davey. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. A couple of questions, really. Um, um, with regards to the cemetery zone, I think natural burials are becoming more and more popular, and that's obviously a, a, a private service that's provided, uh, which takes the burden off of the uh, of the council, um, Martin mentioned um, the cost to us. Obviously, land being at a premium anyway within Swale, um, it is a service we charge for. So, is there uh, any sort of uh, figures, approximating uh, approximate percentage profits or losses on on cemeteries if we were to purchase and then run new cemeteries? Um, uh, to to Graham. Uh, regarding the community asset transfer, um, and we discussed this uh, last night in the community uh, about friends groups and unincorporated groups who don't have uh, any limited liability, such as a CIO. So, um, and if they do default, uh, are they pursued for any outstanding costs that the council would have to bear? um uh, if that's at all possible because uh friends groups are not like a cio they they would all be individually liable as members or trustees and with reference to appendix 2 page 41 um where you are looking at fitting led across all of our property which is pretty much done by now and um, i pointed out one to my nose the other day um do we also look at um standalone solar fittings rather than having to draw from the, the grid. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Day. Um, are you going to pick up the cemeteries one, Martin, or is that Graham? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so um, I'll come back to that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, clearly, there are two alternatives um, in the industry for cemeteries. That is uh, the um, crematoriums that, that that we have in in the borough and, and the natural burial ground. So um, there is certainly a, a good choice um, from in terms of uh, cemeteries. I don't have the exact figures to to hand tonight, Councillor Davy, but um, 
give you an estimate, we take just over £100,000 a year in fees and charges from, from burials um, by the time you take off the management maintenance that, um, you know, the, the preparation before the before the funerals, um, not, you're not looking at it being a profit making um, um, service there. So um, I think there is choice, you know, from our point of view, no, no decisions have to be made tonight by, by councillors. This is very much a, an initial how we set a review. Um, we will go out, the technical assessment will tell us more robustly the, the capacity and the space we have um, and the types of things that we would need to do. We've got some good precedent from the work we did at Iway. It took a long time to set up, but it's up and operational um, and, and being appreciated by those that, that need to use it. Um, so we've got some we've got some good information around set, setting up and, and costs. Um, so uh, yeah, not not a decision tonight, but but one to one to start the conversation. If I can just jump the other one and go while I've got the the microphone and go on to friends groups. I think community asset transfer part of the process is always about doing the due diligence, and absolutely we wouldn't look to be passing over assets. Um, to groups that weren't, weren't fully constituted, didn't have the robust policies and procedures in. So that's where they're much more suited to sports clubs that are established, have a governance structure and, and, and everything like that. So certainly in terms of friends groups, I think it would be very unlikely that we would transfer to, to, to that type of organisation. That doesn't mean that they're not a fundamental part of our parks and open spaces. We work incredibly well with a number of friends groups uh, across the borough um, and the volunteering that they do massively appreciated um, and really helpful in um, meeting councillor true love's view of making parks and open spaces the best we can do um, so uh, i think ho hopefully that clears it up when we were looking at when we're looking at alternative management options of um, open spaces. As Graham says, it's very important that we maintain public access and it will be very rare that we would, um, uh, you know, actual transfer an asset to something that wasn't fully constituted. There was um, something on lead, lead light, lead lights and so, Jim. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of solar lighting, um, we haven't uh, so far, <laughs> experience or, or, or specifically looked at, at, at that. Um, and I think in many ways that revolves around their relative vulnerability uh, in terms of vandalism. Um, we have just installed a, uh, or will be installed, no, have installed um, some electronic gates at um, Mill Creek Country Park um, and they are solar powered. Um, so that will probably be uh, not quite the same, but that will be our first test case in terms of how, how well uh, they survive uh, yeah, going forward. Um, I think with, with um, you yeah, know, it's definitely going to be the way to go in, term, in, in terms of the future, um, you know, to how the technology develops and perhaps they come become a, a bit less vulnerable and and you know back battery, um, so fed from batteries as well, uh, so that they have all night capability, all those yeah. all those sorts of things. So I think it's it, it has potential, but um, certainly we don't have any experience and haven't haven't used to utilised them up to now. Thank you. Okay, Martin, you wants to come in on this as well. Um, yeah, just to add, and, and without sort of uh, pre-rehearsing co conversation at council, when you re uh, review the um, climate and ecological emergency annual report next week at council, um, one of the top ten actions that we're proposing for next year is to look at our estate in terms of PV and so solar power. So not only our buildings, but our open spaces as well. So, um, you know, certainly it's an area that we're, we're new to, but, but starting to look at and uh, we'll be working alongside the property team to, to look at those opportunities. Most of the LED replacements uh, that, that um, are, are 
happening. I'm pleased to report that our first LED replacements along Sheerness seafront have happened. Um, hot off the press, so we are we are starting that process and rolling it out further across all of our open spaces. Thanks, thank you, Martin. Uh, Councillor White. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, and just remaining on the positive, I, I, I'd like to start off by agreeing with uh, Councillor Trudon. I think this is um, very important uh, that we maintain our focus on providing good quality open spaces for the residents of Swale. And I, I think actually the existing policy is the statement he was um, suggesting we ought to make, because I think the existing policy is a very good one. Um, it can be tweaked and, and it will be tweaked, no doubt, with experience. Um, but from my point of view, I think the key principles that are set out in 3.3 on page 9 of the report are, are good principles. And I think they hold as true today as they did um, when the original document was put together in 2017. So uh, to that, um, I would encourage officers to, um, to maintain um, focus on those uh, those key principles. I think the cemetery issue is one. It's ten. It may be ten years off, uh, but I think it's a serious one. And I think that uh, we should uh, we should focus again on on that. And we talk about in four two on page nine the significant risks of local plan if we don't get this sorted. Well, actually, we refer to that on page twenty six of the original plan in twenty seventeen when we said we must do this straight away and it's a bit disappointing so my only downside my only negative comment will be it is a shame uh, that it's taken us five years to bring this back now when there was clearly um there was clearly a view amongst officers and members at the time in 2017 18 and 19 that we ought to be getting on with this before the 19th the 2022 review of the local plan so we're a few years late in coming to this, but hopefully um, if we can stick to the timetable, Chairman, uh, that have been set out by the officers tonight and we can get this sorted uh, by the end of this year, then I think um, we'll go some way in, in repairing this. Um, the only other comment I'll, I'll make, and it's a, it's a broad one, because um, we can go and sit here all night and be here for a very long time. I don't think that would be... Um, good use of our time but during the during the as you go through the report and the appendices there were a number of targets and, and the number of suggestions of how we would improve things and i think when we next visit this subject we could do with updates i mean look there's a there's a whole range of stuff there's examples on page 19 about moving things forward, how we're progressing a rollout of repairs and things. I know the current administration have put more money into that. So how has that worked? And it's really with a view to say to all, all of the aspirations of the existing policy, how well have they been achieved? If they've been achieved, do we need to maintain them as aspirations or can we ease off the gas and put the gas somewhere else? If we're not achieving them, why not? So what needs to change to, to ensure that we can? And there's too many examples. Uh, there's page after page of, of examples of where we would we were hoping that things would improve and we were laying down methods by which that may happen. Um, and I think that say when we come when the committee comes next to look at the chairman, it would be useful to have those updates so that we can see the successes, tick those off, do more. And those that haven't succeeded, why not? How can we make them succeed? And I think that will be a um, a good foundation uh, for for the new policy. So I'll leave it there, if I may. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank Thank you, Councillor Whiting. Do you want to come in and did you want to come in and talk to this issue of how we're reviewing current? Uh, um, yeah. If you want, Councillor Chair. Yeah. OK, I, I mean, I accept what uh, Councillor Whiting was saying, that um, these principles were set out in 2017. The, the big change is, of course, we are now a climate change emergency council, and that does that does make a considerable difference. I, I'm just interested in the recommendation, Chair, um, uh, you know, how this committee is going to contribute. And it says play areas, and I, I already heard that the play areas is actually not going to be 
under our purview. It's going to be un under the um, purview of the community committee. So that 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 needs to change. How how we contribute? I, th I think a regular report back is 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 quite a, a sound suggestion, really. Um, with perhaps aspects coming forward at different times, not not the whole thing every time, but it could be broken down into tar target areas. <coughs> the other thing I would say, um, being pedantic, but the, in three three the heading and the word principles is incorrectly spelled. <laughs> yeah, to you, councillors. OK, thank you, Councillor Trula. So can we bear that in mind that, that, we, that we should be looking to present some kind of review of where, where we've got to next time we, it comes back to, to the committee? Yeah, if I can come back on, on, on both comments. Yeah. Uh, uh, th thank you, Councillor Trula. I'm a sports officer by trade, so uh, school was never my uh, <laughs> strong point, so I so <laughs> appreciate that. The um, substance of that is not <laughs> Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the regular update, yeah, we were, we were going to come on to, to that in the end. Uh, there will be an element of silence for a period because the technical assessment is not a short process. Um, so we said, as, as Graham said, we would certainly um, not see the value in coming back immediately on a regular basis because that technical assessment will add in a lot of the discussion points for for the committee and and so um that that's how we explained it last night in terms of the recommendation heading it's it, it is just called the open spaces and play area strategy so really we're only asking for this committee because of the way the constitution um was set out when we changed the model play areas sit with community and open spaces sit here so we're asking you guys to comment on that and and, and the um community committee to to, to feed in on, on the play area elements. In terms of the local plan, yes, we could and should have started a little bit earlier. We had a small thing that got in a way for a couple of years that, that did take up a fair amount of officer time. So, um, so yeah, we, we have been doing that. But I stand by the comments you made earlier, which is actually this is a robust strategy. The principles have helped us deliver and continue to deliver. It's a really great point about the new strategy updating what's been achieved over the last cycle. That's something we've used in other strategy documents to, to, to say that. And I'm pleased to say there's been a whole raft of, of stuff that we can come back on all of those objectives to, to, to say that we've achieved um, over the strategy period. So, so yeah, I think in summary, um, a bit of silence after today, but the reason we came first was because we wanted um, the way that we asked the consultants and the technical uh, assessments to happen can be guided by comments tonight and, and from last night, and they, they've certainly been really helpful comments. Um, so, yeah, thank you. OK, thank you, Martin. I've uh, got a number of other people wanted to come in, so Councillor Winkless was was next, then Councillor Valentine, and then Councillor Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick question on the play area strategy. Um, I want some clarification on the play area issue. Um, I take it that under the future proposal for play areas, that existing play areas will remain, or will some be removed? Just a straight question. Okay, we, I mean, we're trying to focus on the green spaces, but I'd be happy to just pick up that question quickly, Martin. Um, essentially, uh, if there are any play areas that uh, are in poor condition, um, if we're experiencing sort of real sort of social issues, antisocial behaviour issues with them, uh, if uh, there is uh, alternative uh, provision, um, so they're, they're laid out within a standard um, of you know, walking distance, etc., so that the community can can sort of easily access them. Um, if there are a play areas that sort of fit that bill, then there is currently uh, an option to remove 
Bay areas. Um, we have as, as background, I think we've removed two uh, in this last cycle. Um, but it, it's very much done on a case by case and it, it's not something that we we'll do lightly. It's, it's just purely on, on with that background and with ultimately with members agreement um, to actually do that. OK, thanks. OK, thank you, Councillor Winkless. Um, Councillor Valentine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mainly wanted to talk about the uh, climate emergency, but if I can just pick up on that um, play area point, um, I do have a few concerns about that, that we may be taking resources and putting them into the sort of big flagship um, open spaces and, and neglecting those play areas that may be more difficult to manage and are likely to be in more deprived areas. Um, and I don't have any magic solutions to suggest, but I would um, you know, be concerned that we, we abandon that. Um, I, I understand they can be difficult, um, but I do think perhaps we should um, encourage everyone to think of ways where we might be able to find some solutions to provide access to open areas. Um, amongst communities that may be less mobile and less able to access the, uh, the, um, the, the bigger areas in, in the borough. Um, but uh, to get onto the climate emergency, um, of course, I think as Councillor Trudeau has already mentioned that this is the, the biggest change, I think, that, to this strategy that we would we'd need to see embedded into it. Um, and I'd hope to see it embedded to, throughout the, the strategy document. Um, there's some Appendix two lists some thoughts on that, and I think um, you know I want to support all of those. I think that it's obviously clear that um, some thought has already been put into this, and um, uh, good suggestions. For things. That's one thing um, that's missing from that list. Uh, so I'm pleased to see the uh, minimising use of pesticides and weed killers. Uh, I think that's something important. But perhaps what might be wanted to add to that is um, considering. Uh, changing practices in the sort of grass cutting regime. So although it's important to provide um, sports areas, um, we don't necessarily want the uh, every space um, within a recreation ground, you know, um, perhaps within an inch of its life. Um, and we know that just leaving grass longer improves biodiversity. Um, and there's good practice. I mean, I'm most familiar with Faversham Rec, and I think there's very good practice going on there where the areas that need to be cut are cut. And um, but leaving other areas that don't need to be cut um, uh, for for nature, and of course that also benefits physical and mental health as well as providing a different sort of um, environment and use for that that recreation ground. Um, I, so I think there is mention in this list of biodiversity that probably could be more. So it, it pops up mainly within the coppicing of woodland um, and the um, swale in bloom. Um, but perhaps we could explicitly talk about planting for pollinators um, and improving biodiversity in, in, in those ways. I'm sure that's implicit in this list anyway, but I just think it could be um, drawn out a little bit more. Um, and in, when we turn to um, cemeteries and burials, again, I don't have any solutions, but um, I would like to see us consider um, a natural burial ground. Um, I, I think there's demand for that in the borough. We know the Deer Street um, burial ground is already full, I think. Um, and then you can have a burial ground that then could would um, become a woodland and contribute to our climate emergency um, agenda in, in the long term. So um, I truly take the point that may not be a role for the council, but if we're talking about providing extra burials, let's consider natural burials too. Thanks very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Councillor Valentine. Um, I think we can probably move on to other questions. Can we? We've got Councillor Hampshire and Councillor Whiting, if you could come in very briefly yes, afterwards, indeed. because I've got other, other councillors wanted to come in. Councillor Hampshire. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, I pretty much fully agree with a lot of things that have been said and also some of the concerns that have been raised by, by members this evening. Um, but I think 
it is difficult to separate open spaces from play areas because there are far too many examples across the borough where actually the two are intermingled. So you could take King George's in Woodstock, you could take the play stall in my ward up in Baldwin, you've got Grove Park, you've got City Bourne Rec, you've got Fabersham Rec, the list is endless. I'm sure there's places on the island, but I'm not even familiar <laughs> with where they may be, but probably by the train station, it, it um, would probably be a prime example. So I think you actually, you, you can't do that distinction. And I think that may be something that needs to be looked at in the future for this committee. But what concerns me is um, the approach being taken perhaps with the local plan and this idea that any new spaces are going to have to go over to, to management companies and all of that. And I, I wholeheartedly share the concerns that Councillor Davey has, has, has said. Um, because to me, that's a tax on the, the householder, because essentially for the management company to be there on the new estate, it's highly likely that there will be some element of leasehold arrangements in, in place and as opposed to, to freehold. And we all know that those arrangements don't necessarily always work in the interests of, of the residents for, for numerous reasons. I think there needs to be a greater focus on existing providers. And one of the things that came out of the meeting last night was the focus on you know, the, the more urban areas, because that is essentially where the council actually has the responsibility for the play areas, because in the rural areas, there's a lot of parish councils out and about, and that, that's fair enough. But if you're going to have these large developments come forward, I really do feel that the council can't shirk responsibility of providing play areas. You know, they should, the council should be providing play areas for those new communities because I don't actually feel it's appropriate to necessarily enhance some of the existing ones. So if you take, for example, an application in Bobbin, where are they likely to go? Possibly Grove Park. We've got a climate emergency declared. Well, how are they going to get from the Bobbin estate to the Grove Park? It's not going to be necessarily by walking. It's going to be by cars. And that's going to create additional problems for the council. So I don't actually think the council should shirk responsibility in, in all areas. Um, and lastly, I don't think we should have a policy whereby every sort of new estate should have a play area attached to it because then what you could have is you could have half a dozen play areas within 300 yards and actually what would be more beneficial to the community is if they actually have an outstanding play area where actually the, the resources are, are pulled um, and I think where future housing may go it is likely to be in areas where the council doesn't itself own the play areas and I think there may be need to be greater dialogue with those third party providers, with those parish councils, to see what capacity they have to take on the additional costs, but also what the council can do to help them and making sure that the section 106 agreements that are in place are actually appropriate to the community and actually do deliver and don't get forgotten about. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hampshire. Was there anything you wanted to pick up on in that? And then the kind of general comments really weren't there yeah. about yeah. I think it would be remiss of me not to say that obviously the policy of taking on more and more playgrounds means more and more maintenance costs, potentially higher staff resources needed um, to maintain them. And obviously that's a trend in the direction that the council is not going at the moment where we're looking to reduce. So every piece of open space that we take on has an additional grounds maintenance cost. Every play area we take on means more people going to visit it on a weekly basis to check that it's safe and, and various other things. So that was certainly, I remember us having this conversation when this strategy um, went, went through committees, uh, Councillor Hampshire. I don't think it's an easy um, decision either way. We've taken that decision on the basis of we're already at X amount of open space, 80 odd play areas, and that bit, there was no ability to continue taking more and more. So that's that's why the, the strategy um, was developed in this way. Um, we are seeing really great examples of um, developers and management companies looking after open space and play, and we're seeing some not so great examples. Um, so clear, clearly there are, um, there are alternative views uh, either way on that. Um, Graham spends a lot of time sifting through 
such uh, planning applications doing exactly what you're proposing, which is looking and going, well, that one's near an existing play area or an existing open space of ours. And actually, rather than creating it on their site, it's within 10 minutes walk-in catchment. So let's improve what's already there and make it make it better. And so that's already a key bit process of work that happens um, under under the current strategy. OK, thank you, Martin. So, Councillor Whiting, can you come very in? Very briefly, but thank yeah. you for allowing me to come back. And on that very last point, this is one example, a new, a new development in uh, Tenham in my ward, um, where the developer contributions went to Tenham Parish Council uh, to improve the play area on the other side of Station Road that they already owned um, and, and managed. And I think that uh, is an example of where it can work well. And of course, then the on costs fall with the Parish Council, not not uh, not with the borough council it was just two very quick uh, clarifications i think um I, I forgot to say about about the um uh, the asset transfer policy i mean as, as an architect of that i think i i think it has been well managed and i think it's because it's been so well managed that we haven't seen uh, some of the difficulties that councillor davey referred to uh, that may have happened so i, I would hope that we'll continue with that as part of the policy moving forward um, and managed in the same way. Um, I, I would also make a suggestion because I, I, I agree also play areas really ought to sit um, with other open spaces um, and whether that requires um, a motion from this committee to ask uh, PNR or to ask somebody uh, to look at the constitution to change that. Um, I don't know whether it be support for that chairman within um, within what uh, within the, the group here tonight, but uh, uh, it, it would seem if we if we want to have play areas in with open spaces under this committee, then we need to put a request in uh, by a PNR whoever uh, to, to to make that slight amendment uh, to the constitution. And very last point, because we talked about disposal of play areas, there is a, a on page thirty one it refers to. Um, that the policy does allow officers to dispose of them um, with uh, consultation with the with the portfolio holder. Well, I just wondered, just as a matter of clarity, and it's the only question in my comments, um, how does that process work now that we are under this new system? Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Whiting, do you, do you want to deal with any of those issues and then we'll come on to your I think you're making a proposal that we we go. I think back to you the constitution. Yeah, so the constitutional committee apparently would be um, to uh, request that play parks come under our responsibility. I think in terms of the um, policy, um, whereas previously sort of a, uh, to the portfolio holder, I think in uh, how the, we're now constituted, um, it would come back to members. A committee, um, notwithstanding that perhaps it will go to community at the minute, um, depending on you know, future arrangements, should we say. So, um, is is there an interest in um, us going back to the Constitution Committee to suggest that Frank, you're seconding, you're, you're seconding it? Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Can we, can we comment? Yes, of course. I can see that. I mean, when Councillor Hampshire said you can't separate the players from the open space, that's clearly logically sensible. I, I just think that the two committees might have a slightly different perspective <laughs> on, on, on what we want to do with the players. So we would be considering it in total. They might be considering much more closely, you know, is this player meeting the demographic of this local area? I think for the time being, it might be appropriate for both committees to, to have a purview of that. And then if it does become irrational, then by all means go back to the Constitution Committee. I just don't want to have to go to a Constitution meeting. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. You to your time, Jim. Uh, OK, so I've got Councillor um, Maybe wanting to come in and then we'll decide how to move forward on this. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think uh, Councillor Hampshire makes a fair point. Uh, you, know, you do have play areas such as Dillington Drive, which is a play area, uh, a small 
a smaller play area, and then you had Milton Rec, which you didn't mention, obviously, um, <laughs> <laughs> which has a play area within it and has a sports ground um, and football pitches as well. So I think he makes a fair point with the demarcation. Uh, but also, I understand Council the true last point there as well. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. So I think we've. You you are you wanting to make this proposal? Uh, chairman, chairman, is it just whether we could just ask the chairman of PNR just to consider whether it may be something he might want to talk at informal groups with informal chairman's groups that exist, um, just through those informal channels to see if it's essential. It's a way forward. I mean, but I don't think you need to vote on that, but, but something you can take back to your Yeah, chairman. okay. So, so we could raise that the, the, there's clearly an issue which uh, needs thinking about, yeah. but that the, the, were varying views and you can see. Okay. <coughs> so, um, Councillor Stephen wanted to come in, and then I'm hoping to close this item. Mine's just a very quick add on to Councillor Valentine's um, biodiversity list and sort of to encourage businesses, schools to uh, wild their hedgerows and, uh, and a natural wilding of, of hedgerows as long as they're not impinging on the highway because that will help with um, air quality and uh, biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. So hopefully you've got a range of, uh, of views there and, and something to work with as you and uh, move forward with, with the review. So thank you, Mendes, for that discussion. So the next item is item seven, the Sitting Bourne Car Club proposal. I'm hoping this is going to be fairly straightforward. Um, can I draw your attention to the fact that there's a, a blue paper at the end? I'm hoping everyone's take had a look at that uh, beforehand and uh, I don't think there's a lot of detail in there, and I'm hoping that we won't need to go into private session. I think the details there are, are fairly straightforward, but obviously that will be uh, down to uh, to members of the committee. Yeah. So um, let's move on to this item, item seven. And is this going to be introduced by Grace? I presume it is. Yeah. So over to you, Grace. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Um, so uh, you're likely aware that we launched a car club in Faversham uh, in April of last year, um, and this proposal is looking to uh, expand that into Sittingbourne Town Centre as well. Um, the car club being uh, low emission vehicles in the town centre that um, can be booked at low cost to promote motor shift away from car ownership um, and can reducing emissions. Uh, so the current car club um, has been deemed as quite successful. Um, Como UK. Uh, show a successful car club as one that's reached 30 to 40 percent utilisation across a kind of 24 seven period. Uh, so, uh, as you can see in the paper, um, uh, our current vehicles have one of reached over 50 percent utilisation, which is incredibly high for a car club. Um, and it's visually successful in the first uh, uh, nearly young people to the year, actually. Um, uh, statistics from um, a hire car who run that car club for us uh, includes that. Um, in, just in the first quarter, drivers using a car club uh, will have saved a total of 6.39 tonnes of CO2 uh, and we've also uh, saved uh, nearly £24,000 um, across those drivers, so around uh, just under £900 per driver uh, as a result of using a car club rather than uh, owning the vehicle themselves. Uh, you can also see some anecdotal testimonies in, in the report, um, but the one I'll summarise is that one customer said this is a really cost effective and even friendly way of having access to a car. Uh, more vehicles like this please their husbands are customer satisfaction levels have been fairly friendly high. Uh, so this leads us uh, to look at expanding the car club to sitting born um, and to continue to encourage that mode of shift in, in another town, uh, reducing transport costs for residents while easing congestion, uh, reducing car compression, improving air quality. So when considering the expansion of the car club, both City Board and Sheerness were considered um, uh, and we received feasibility assessments from Hire Car, these are the uh, two and three, um, although I appreciate that the, the colour and the, the scale uh, is uh, very easy to read on the paper version. Um, uh, uh, so from that, uh, they showed that the feasibility for City Board was currently much higher. 
uh, is those accompanied by a range of developments working with Hyacar over the last six months to introduce EV car clubs uh, within uh, within their sites, uh, sort of mainly around sitting in Newington. Um, so it does tie in nicely to continue to uh, uh, provide our own vehicles here at uh, sitting on town centre. Um, we have also uh, proposing to use funding from the S56 monies for airport integration from Hankey, as uh, so that also lends itself to sitting more fee. Uh, that's the most suitable definition at present, but uh, plans for this would be considered um, uh, at a later date. The proposed locations for the car park vehicles, uh, so Spring, Spring Street car park, Avenue Road car park, and Bell Road car park have been set out uh, in the report in front of you. Uh, so this gives a good distribution of cars around the town centre. Um, I do they need to be in 10 minute walking distance to each other so that our car is built out and you can access another one quite easily. Uh, one is by the station, uh, one is a car park with an existing charge point so that you can make that an EV uh, if that's the decision made tonight. Um, and then uh, um, one on the other side of town uh, 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 to set them out, much as goes out, all nearby to areas with uh, high on street parking demands and people who um, may other, not otherwise be able to access a car uh, and we don't have off street parking. Uh, so the um, uh, the ambition for the car club is that it will be self financing by the end of the contract. So this is getting the fashion uh, car club as well. Uh, and we are also proposing that we would um, launch a launch the, uh, the car club on a two year contract. The fashion car club was three years. Uh, so this was also end in February 2025, um, so that both uh, uh, contracts would be reviewed at the same time. Uh, this means that the time scale would be to launch as soon as possible to ensure we can align these contracts. Uh, um, another uh, uh, section of this is uh, the addition of an EV within the car club. Um, so this uh, is the setup we have in Travisham. Uh, I've seen the EV has been uh, quite well booked out since it was since it was introduced in November, I believe. Um, this uh, adds an element to the car club in a try before you buy uh, type style. So a resident that may continue to own a car but wants to look at um, using uh, an EV for a short period of time to see if that suits their need. Um, would be quite useful. We would propose that this is installed at Albany Road, uh, where the recent charge points have been uh, installed and have been breach proofed. So, that installing an additional uh, cellular charge point for the car club would be relatively easy uh, and a low, a low cost, but our folks would still need to be obtained on this. So, to be able to expand the car club with the same provider, so using higher car uh, and bring consistency across the borough. Uh, we are proposing to provide a de direct award to hire car uh, by a framework agreement um, and the two costs of either a fully hybrid or a mixed electric uh, uh, hybrid uh, car park being set up as well. Um, so uh, I think that's everything on that so one. clarifications. Okay, thanks so very much, uh, Grace. That was uh, very comprehensive for us. So we've got two recommendations here to agree uh, the car club expansion and to proceed with the, the direct award to buy the car. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to open the discussion. I've got Councillor Trulove wanting to come up. Thank, thank you, Chair, and in those eternal words, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, this is brilliant. Hooray. Um, this is, um, I mean, when, when we decided to go to Spavisham, it was obviously with the trial in mind and it's worked out i think better than we expected so it's, it's clearly established as something that's worth doing when we celebrated that people have come at me on social media and said what oh, Fabersham, what about us as they do um and i said oh it won't be long before city board and here we are that's exactly what we're going to do so that's that's splendid um, and I, I think that will be a good thing, City Um It'd be nice to be in Spring Street because that would demonstrate to everybody that we're not going to build there. <laughs> because there is a misconception that that's what we're going to do. But just, just to go with well, a couple of other points, paragraph 2-7, um, if we are going to do this in City Bourne, as sure as eggs, we've got to look at Sheerness straight away afterwards. We cannot <laughs> do it in two of our main towns and not the other one. So once cinema was also proved to be a success, or even before that, we really must go to, to Sheerness as well. 
because it is self-supporting. It's not just want to hit our budget. Um, I, I, I like the uh, in two ten try before you buy. I think that is a good principle, really. That um, ha having this facility does give people the opportunity to, you know, try an EV EV vehicle, um, and then it might it might give them more confidence to actually go and um, purchase that for their own general use. And the last thing I say, Chair, is the first line in two nine. You shouldn't have that apostrophe there. <laughs> OK, thank you, Councillor Trula. Do you want to deal with the last point or will you just briefly talk to the to, uh, to the other? Thanks, I just minute my previous comment. <laughs> OK, so I've got Councillor Hampshire and then Councillor Whiting to come in. Yeah, I, I just have a couple of questions if I may. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, one of the questions I've got is, say I pick up the car with sitting board, would I now be able to drop it off in fashion? So say I've booked a hotel um, and I, I live in Albany Road, I had the car for the day, I drop it off, return it to a point in fashion. Can I do that or do I have to pick up and drop off? doing in a hotel in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using it as an example. Um, you know, can, can, can I do that or am I restricted to actually returning the vehicle back to the point where I collected it from? Because there are other sort of big known, shall we say, um, car companies where you can turn up with a mobile phone, book a car, and it doesn't necessarily have to go back to where you picked it up from. And it's whether this allows that facility or not. I'm not trying to label names, but I'm sure you all know what, they, what company I might be referring to. And then the other thing is um, a taxi company <laughs> will have differential pricing depending upon whether you go for like a hybrid vehicle or whether you go for a, a luxury, uh, an electric vehicle, etc. Clearly the cost, and I'm not starving in the blue paper, but clearly the cost on the open market of a, an electric car is more than that of a hybrid car. Um, and I just wonder whether there's the ability to have some sort of differential pricing structure um, within um, the, the, the highest thing as well. But other than that, I think it's a great idea. I think it has huge potential and if it does get rolled out into sort of more rural areas as well let's not forget about those yes. um, as as well as on the island if there is that ability to do that sort of interchangeable drop off that actually will make the schemes much easier i feel to roll out more widely and more quickly um, across the bar and allow more people the opportunity to take this off the line okay thank you uh grace are you going to answer those questions yeah, so on being able to drop the cars off, um, this would currently be on a back-to-base model. Um, that is a model that other operators um, use, but just due, due to the scale, um, it would bring additional cost because someone's got to get that car back to the original um, site. But after the two years, it may be something that a um, uh, higher car with it as a, a self-financing self uh, model might look to introduce as they increase the number of cars. Um, regarding differential pricing, uh, this isn't something that we directly control within the contract, um, but if you take a look at the hire car app, I'm, I don't live in Fabisham, but I check it every now and then, and um, the, currently the hybrids uh, do drop as low as £2 an hour. The electric car, I believe, is £4 an hour at times, uh, but this is also because it's a larger vehicle, um, so it comes at a higher cost. Uh, and I believe hire car review that on a regular basis. And then also just on rural areas, that I am working closely with the active travel coordinator, um, because obviously this links quite closely with um, increasing active travel um, to look at how we can get car clubs into rural areas and work with parishes. Uh, yeah, quickly. Um, the, the only other question I was going to ask is um, the proposal is for two hybrid and for one electric. Fine, fair enough, don't have a problem with that. But it's why have you decided to, to do that? Because hybrids actually fall foul of the future government legislation of plans of like phasing out diesel and petrol hybrids get caught up in that as well and so from a future proofing point of view has that been considered when you've been doing your calculations yes so it has been considered um we did look initially at fully ev car club for fabersham um 
but on a range of factors, it was decided to include the hybrids, partly due to accessibility. Um, a lot of people have never driven an EV before, um, so we still prefer that they are moving to some sort of modal shift and, and not owning a car um, and using a car club. Um, there's also the higher cost of installing charge points, but as we are increasing our infrastructure around the borough, making sure the future proof that would make it easier to switch the vehicles out. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have the exact wording of the previous contract, but I believe we did include a clause to switch the vehicles to EV if we thought it was the suitable time. Uh, so as we've only just switched one of the vehicles to EV at Babsham due to delays with the charge point. Um, we'd be yet to see uh, how well that's been taken up. Uh, but if it does prove to be more successful than the hybrids, then I believe it's within the contract that we can swap it out, but it does come at a higher cost. It is being looked at. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Councillor Whiting. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a couple of comments, and uh, forgive me if I'm a little bit of a pen, but I won't, I won't go into the apostrophes. But it, and, and this is a good idea, and from little little acorns, great oaks do grow, and all of that. And I think it's a it's a good thing uh, to do. When I look at two five, for example, it says on average a car club takes six to twelve cars off the road, um, and therefore reduces congestion. And, and all, I think we're sort of overstating some of the benefits here, aren't we? <laughs> you know, and 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 trying to reduce parking pressures. We're taking twelve cars off the road maximum. Um, we are, it will, but marginally. And I think we just need to be a little bit more realistic in the language uh, that we might use. One of the, the more serious questions, let's talk, the one that when we talk about saving CO2, um, I just wondered what we're comparing that with, uh, particularly given that uh, two of these cars will be hybrid cars, they won't be fully electric. And I, so I just wonder where um, the company, uh, the, the high car company, are getting their comparisons to show those uh, CO2 reductions. Thank you. Thanks. Distribute the um, full KPI report, which has that methodology from Higher Carb. I don't have that uh, right now. Uh, so the majority of the CO2 reductions don't necessarily come from the cars itself, as you mentioned, a hybrid isn't that much um, lower than a commercial diesel car, um, although they are better emission wise. Um, but it's more about the modal shift of someone who might uh, give up their personal use car and switch to using a car club. So alongside that will come more uh, journeys that are uh, walked, cycled or using public transport. So that's where the savings come in from the data that hire car has on their customers' user. Habits. Okay, thank you, Grace. So, is this someone prepared? To, do, you, do you want to speak? Just briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jen. I just wanted to uh, just make one point. Uh, um, so I won't repeat any of the comments I've made. I'm extremely pleased that the Faversham uh, Car Club has been a success. I wasn't entirely convinced it would take off, and we don't. But it's nice to see that it has. Um, I think it's an extremely good way of using Section 106 money that is allocated for air quality, because I think it's hard with um, the um, Section 106 money to sometimes see that the measures that can be introduced are effective, you know, so providing people with a reduced bus travel for a, uh, a year or, or two, or even in having a bus route that's funded for two or three years. But the trouble is then that ends and um, uh, there's, there's you know, the, the benefit that will continue. So I think the, the car club model where we can fund something for two or three years and then it becomes self-sustaining um, is, a, is a much uh, better better model for that. And the point really I wanted to make, I think this also helps tackle the cost of living crisis. So if people have a car, the, the problem with car ownership is that um, all the costs come up front. You know, you have to buy the car, you have to insure it, you have to tax it, you have to get it fixed. Um, and once you're paying out all that money, the, the psychological um, uh, incentive then is to use the car as much as possible because that justifies your, your expenditure. Um, whereas if you can give up owning a car altogether, you can lose all those initial costs. And if you don't use the car that much, you can then, you know, when you do need access to a car, you get it through a car club. So I think that's a much better model of our relationship with cars, which I'm, I think it's, it would be great to be able to push that as much as possible. So. I look forward to a successful car having sitting born and in China. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Th
OK, thank you, Councillor Valentine. Um, are we ready to move to the recommendations? Can I have a proposal? Councillor Valentine, seconder. Councillor Davy. Um, <laughs> so um, those in favour, I think we can take the two recommendations together. Those in favour? Unanimous. So that's that's the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Issuing that is at eight sixteen.